I can't tell you how wonderful it is to be in here in our newsroom and have you all here and enjoying yourselves. Thank you so much on the, uh, uh, on the world's hottest day for being here. At the beginning of the day, I said thank you so much for coming um, on this, the world's hottest day. Now I realise that you're staying. You're out there. Um, but I just wanted to say I'm James Harding and this is... Oh, I'm Katie. <laughs> Co-founders talks, and this is the very last thinking in our very first festival of thinkings. And it's about things that cannot be said. And it probably is evident to you that one of the things that really couldn't be said about six to eight weeks ago was that in putting on a festival of thinkings, we had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> and it was only through the just brute determination, skill, charm, and relentless hard work of a number of people that we got here. And so I just wanted to say a colossal thank you Firstly, to Lois and James. Hey, James. Well, they, they, James. <laughs> we, had, we, we had our we had our meeting with our investors on Thursday, and uh, Katie and I were giving a presentation about the future of the newsroom and digital journalism. And next door, uh, Lois and James and Liz Mosley, the members editor, were running what was effectively a modern sweatshop, <laughs> trying to make sure that everyone had a lanyard and a badge and making sure that everyone got properly welcomed. And you may notice they've all got stickers on them instead of the actual numbers. There was a printing error, so they literally had to manually do everything by hand. <laughs> and I wanted to say particularly to Steph, and Eleanor and Ellie, who've made sure that we've had an amazing run of extraordinary people. Thank you to you. Um, and then I just wanted to say that uh, a lot of the time, one of the things that Katie and I like taking credit for is the design tortoise. This is because people come up to us and say, I love your logo, I love the colours, the texture, the app. Always it's the case that actually neither of us had anything to do with that at all, but John Hill is the person who's done all of that. And then, sorry, this is the last thank you. Uh, if you hold a festival, Mazel Tov, if you hold a festival, the, the, the one thing that you really, really care about, or at least I really care about, is the booze and the food. And Liv has made sure that we've been fed and watered and had the most brilliant time. And I hope once this is done, you won't leave, but stick around and join us for a drink afterwards. Uh, and when you do, please toast Liv. So thank you very much, Liv. Liv. Happy note, things, those things must be said. Over to you, Arifa Akbar, on things that cannot be said. Hello, everyone. Now, what I've realized in these past two days is that I've got a really quiet voice, so please tell me at any point. I've still got to raise it, have I? <laughs> this is going to be painful, painful. Okay, welcome, everyone. Things that cannot be said in comedy and outside of it. Let's begin with a Ricky Gervais quote, not a, not a joke. Um, if you don't believe in a person's right to say things that you find grossly offensive, then you don't believe in free speech. So he's echoing that Voltaire's guiding principle to cede the right for people to say the things that we might object to, uh, things that we might find highly offensive, and for comedians to be able to joke about these things. And perhaps, you know, Comedy is where these things are best talked about. Comedy, which has traditionally been a place for venting, challenging, um, expressing all that isn't normally said in polite society. Um, or is it the case that getting a laugh out of other people's differences, size, gender, sexuality, race, so much more, um, getting a laugh there seeps into the rest of the world and stirs up a kind of hate? Um, should we adhere to, to politically collect, correct lang language that aspires to sort of inclusive plural values, or should we stop being snowflakes about it? 
um, before we get to all of that and much more, I'm sure, I'll tell you quickly what the, what the thinking format is. Forgive me for those people who are completely familiar with it. It's a discussion that takes place in the, in the whole room, between the whole room. It's um, not the panel of speakers, even though we have a brilliant panel and, and very, very illustrious too of speakers. Um, they're here to spark the room to speak and guide the discussion. So we thought of this as a way to create a more dynamic form of journalism. Normally in a news outlet, you have a small circle of editors, they go into a room, they think up stories that they think will appeal to you, they think those are the stories of the day. And we're suggesting that, that those aren't always on completely the stories that you, you're interested in. So we, we hope to formulate something here, you know, ideas, opinions, attitudes that will fire or power our written journalism. That's the idea. Um, so quick rules before, just house rules, is that we have an hour. You can see on that graph over there, there's a tortoise on the left when it reaches the right, and over here as well when it reaches the right, that's the end of the hour, and we wrap up. There's, no, there's a no question policy just because the thinking is about all of us talking. So there's comments rather than questions. There's cameras in the room, but they're unobtrusive. And just please, if you could just the first time you speak, would you just say your name, introduce yourself? That, that's the sort of rules out of, the, out of the way. Let's get on to the brilliant panel. Um, we have here Libby Purvis, um, journalist and broadcaster and, and a well-loved voice of Radio 4. Next to her, we have <laughs> Lynn Enright, journalist and author of um, Vagina, a re-education. And I think it'll be interesting to discuss kind of language around shame and decency and all of that that vaginas, the, the mere mention, um, often inspires. Uh, we have Scarlett Curtis right here, who's a writer, journalist, blogger. She's curated a brilliant book called uh, Feminists Don't Wear Pink and Other Lies. Uh, we have next to her Michelle uh, Deswart, comedian, TV presenter, vice reporter in America. And right at the end, we have... Um, well, who do we have? <laughs> uh, Jade, uh, Jade Adams, who's a, who's a comedian. So that's the full compliment. Now, this isn't stalling, but before we all start talking, can we just watch Ricky Gervais? It, it's literally a minute's clip. So, I, this, this is maybe it's a pointless question, but who found it funny? <laughs> I think most of us found it funny, panel included. There's one hand up on the panel. 
<laughs> Fine. <laughs> um, and who, who thought it something shouldn't be said? You know, that shouldn't have been said. There's a, there's a lone hand. Tom, can I invite you to say why you felt it shouldn't be said? Well, I don't think you should be censored, um, but I think you should have made the decision not to do that bit because I think there's things that are funnier and uh, don't pick on things that you can't help um, or don't pick on a group that are traditionally the butt of most jokes, um, not for very um, morally justifiable reasons. I mean, parts of it are slightly funny, but... Um, obviously, I don't think he should be banned for saying it, but I think I would, you know, if I was going to critique his comedy, which I'm never going to do, mm. but <laughs> I would say to him, pick a better bit, pick something that's funnier, mm. don't pick a joke you've been telling for 15 years in every show you've made. And you talk about, the, you talk about those groups, and we've, we've picked a fairly benign clip there, because I think many of us will know that he, he then, he, he has been uh, made, making jokes about the trans community, and... and People have found that unfunny. There's two hands up already. There's one here and a second there. Go for it. So, I mean, and just introduce yourself if you I'm would. I'm Thomas Clark. I mean, I found that very funny. But what I found funny was not the joke about fat people. It was the fact that Ricky Gervais was such an idiot. And and you know, I mean, what I mean is, is he is. What was funny was his behaving in such an appalling way. And um, I mean, that's the reason he did it. I mean, that's his joke, which is, you know, he's portrayed someone who is, who is, has these terrible opinions. And it's the terrible opinions mm. that are funny about it. So mm. this is quite, actually quite a subtle joke. It's, I didn't find it so funny. I found it the very slightly funny, the fat people thing, you know, very, very minor and I'm ashamed to say way. But what was really funny was him coming out with those. So interesting, terrible, terrible opinion yeah. is the joke. It's the persona of the terrible person. There's there and then you. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not funny. Um, I didn't find it funny because I just don't think it's true. I don't think that people are fat. I think it's funny that people are fat because they eat too much. Maybe that's true. Oh, it's for true. Poor, poor <laughs> <laughs> just to let you know, babe, it's true. <laughs> Is it, is it who says the joke, you know, more than, more, more than the joke itself, is, is, is the question we there. We eat a lot and we don't want to exercise. That's basically, basically the fundamental uh, bits of being fat is you do both of those things. But the issue that we have is the judgment you get from people. I was with a girl the other day. I was on radio, I was on radio with a girl. And she said to me, she said, well, the thing is with me is that I just I feel really good when I'm healthy. And I said to her, I said to her, where does that come from? So I saw, I love when I meet people that are like, yeah, but you're like not healthy and I feel better this way. So I was like, I'll, I'll do some digging. So I asked her where this feeling comes from. By the way, I'm Jay's, I'm fat. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, uh, I asked her where this feeling come from. She was like, well, when I grew up, like, my mother always used to say, like, you know, we must, like, look after ourselves and we do this, this and this. And I went, OK, so perhaps your mother has said to you that there's an issue with you being fat when you were little. So now your feelings about it are uh, around the fact that your mother thinks it's better for you to be thin. Whereas my mother was more interested in making me and my sister do freestyle disco dancing around the towns <laughs> uh, without even a commenting on it. Like she, it wasn't like a massive... And anyone who did comment on the fact that I've always been chubby, it was sort of... It was... I, basically, for me, that's... He's not the best comedian in the world, mm. but that's funny. Mm. Um, and I'm saying that, and I'm fat. But the reason I find it funny is because I've never been a victim of my mm. weight... And I, I'm not, like, I feel very strong in who I am. And, but that's literally because of my upbringing. There are some people that don't have the privilege that I've got to have the parents I've got with this. So the thing is with comedy is it's so subjective to people's experiences and, and the way that they're raised that you couldn't possibly ever come to any understanding about whether or not that's funny or not. But, like, if this, like, you could be in, like, you could be in Fat People Anonymous and they would find it hilarious, depending on, <laughs> on, on, depending on what, what experience they've had with their weight growing up. Mm. Some people are sad about being fat. Some people mm -hmm. are happy about being fat. It all, it's so, like, 
so, so complicated. Yeah. I don't think he should be sent. I don't think he should okay. be sent. Okay. Anyway. I want to come to both of you as comedians. I want yeah. to just address something with you directly. But I think we interrupted your point. Can we, do you want to just finish it? Sorry, it, I didn't no, mean no, to. No, no, not you. I mean, just to let you no, sort of say it properly. It, it is complicated. That's what I'm yeah. saying. It's just yeah. very kind of backward to say that it's just down to one reason. There's lots of things that, that can contribute to that. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so, so Jade and Michelle, is that can you afford to care about offending in comedy? You know, and what are your limits, if so? So, so Michelle, I think that everyone has their own sort of moral compass, right? I think as far as freedom of speech, um, you should be able to say what you want. That's freedom of speech, but. If the, if, the, if the general sort of collective turn around and go, we don't like that, then you can then not be, that you then can't be offended about that and be like, well, it's not fair. No, you can say what you want. And also, everyone is allowed to not like your joke. Mm. In terms of, <laughs> you know what I mean? So there's, there's this, um, there was a scenario where, um, I live most of the time in New York, where uh, a comic, and it comes up every now and again, a white comic had said the N-word on stage. And so there was this big discussion amongst comedians online saying, is that okay? And, and some white comedians have got away with it and made an interesting point about it. Now, this comedian in question got punched in the face. Mm. An audience member got up on stage and punched <laughs> him in the face. And he was like, oh, I can't believe freedom of speech. I said, yes, there's freedom of speech. If you want to go up on stage and say the N-word, you can. But you might get punched in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and so, in terms of in terms of the Ricky Gervais um, clip that's been picked, is is maybe isn't the best one to kind of really highlight what this topic's about mm. because, uh, you know, being overweight is not. I mean, I'm not even sure if it's a minority at this point <laughs> in the UK. <laughs> Physically, we're a majority. <laughs> 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 Statistically, I think as well. So I think yeah. that um, uh, it, you know, there's there's a difference between a comedian and and making fun of your own ignorance, which I think is what you were saying you liked about Ricky Gervais is that he was being ignorant, and that's what you found funny. So you know, it's that kind of thing about punching up mm -hmm. or punching down. Mm. And um, you know, if the joke's on you at the end, and people are laughing because what you're saying is ignorant, and you're knowing that what you're saying is ignorant, then I think it can be justifiable if okay. it ignites people to think. Just Jade, do you have, uh, Scarlett, I'm going to bring you in, but Jade, do you have limits to your, you know, is there a limit? And is, are certain things out of bounds? I'd absolutely never say the N-word on stage, and absolutely. I'll you in the face. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would never, ever, so I, yeah, only, yeah. I only, take the, I only take the piss out of things that reflect me, because I don't, I won't ever punch down. It'll always be, I'll punch it myself or I'll punch higher than me, but I you know I'd never I'd never take a minority group and go, oh I can make some jokes about that. Like I sometimes, like I've got a brother who's half Chinese and I do some jokes about him, but it's because it's a family dynamic I have and I grew up with him. Um, and it's not like my brother's in, in any way, he's not a victim of me or anything. I've got a brother-sister relationship with him. But it also I wouldn't like I wouldn't do some like 90 I'm not gonna say what it is, but I wouldn't do some 90s comedy about the fact that he's Asian or anything because I'm a better comedian than that and mm. I think that uh, <laughs> I, uh, there's lots of other worse things than him he doesn't come to gigs um, <laughs> and says that the reason he doesn't is because I won't come and watch him do electrics so um, there's, <laughs> there's lots of other things about him that are much funnier than that but I, I think I, I think that you know Ricky's that type of comedian, isn't he? Like, he does portray the idiot and the ignorant. And he's, like, he, him himself, he's, he's a nice guy who, like, loves his family. He's not... He, he, that guy he is on stage is, a, is a basically a... is a version of himself that he is, he's portraying for an audience's laughter. Let's leave Ricky behind for a minute. Yeah. What about, you know, uh, uh, the rape jokes? What about Daniel Tosh, you know, a few years ago, make, making a rape joke and a lot of people feeling that it ought not to have been said. I think what annoys me... So I'm called a snowflake all the time, and it's something I'm very proud of, but what annoys me about things like this is we talk as if 
Ricky Gervais is in a prison being punished for making these jokes. He's not. He's got a lot of money. No one's ever actually censored him. No one's ever actually said he can't say these things. And I think no one ever describes themselves as politically, politically correct. Politically correct is something we put on other people as a way of silencing them. All political correctness is, is people asking to not be offended by everyday conversation or by everyday life. And I think truly politically correct, the idea of political correctness gone too far has been created as a way for people who've never been silenced and who've never been discriminated against to position themselves as the underdog and position themselves as someone who is being discriminated against and who is in threat of their civil liberties being upset when they're not. They never are and they never have been. And no one, whenever anyone says to me, don't you think this is political correctness going too far, I always just say, give me an example. Like, as soon as it goes too far, I will stop. Completely. Like, I'll acknowledge that and that's fine. But give me an example because no one ever has anything. It's just this imaginary state of like censorship that we've invented. I feel like it's a sorry, just a a cutting, but I feel like normally that's a response to you saying, you know what, what you just said offended me, and instead of that person being accountable and addressing it, they go, well, our political correctness has gone too yeah. far, and I'm so bored with that answer. I'm just like, it's totally. such a cop-out, and you know? I think we're in this weird state where people want to be discriminated against who have never been. So if you think about something like Charlottesville, <laughs> you know, all the people in Charlottesville weren't marching because they really cared about the statue. They were marching because they wanted to be positioned as the underdog who could march, who could go on a protest, who could do all this stuff when actually they just want an excuse to get their anger out and to be violent and horrible. Okay, all right, there's, there's a speaker here. Hi, I'm Gulid, uh, I'm, okay. and I'm Somali, and I, I'm uh, an artist as well. <laughs> but uh, what I want to add about this is I think this topic is becoming prominent in our society because of the fact that we document everything now, from uh, online media being in not in just my hands, but in yours. Equally, someone could be on Twitter right now, sending an email, or live streaming this very conversation we are having. So the fact that this amount of eyes are on me immediately makes me think, if I say this, do I have to be politically correct? to achieve my aim, or am I going to be forever held accountable for it as long as the internet exists? So it's sort of policing of Do you not think you should be held accountable for the things you say? I do, personally, but the thing is I understand my words have power. So as a, as a person, if I say anything, my words <coughs> can affect someone and push someone to something. So it has to be always said in context. Okay, thank you. So there's that third and fourth. So first, second, third, fourth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, My name is Kieran, and following on from that point, you know, should language be pleased? Yes, we have to be attentive and call it things. But it's almost like this discussion, figuring out what can and can't be said, is the ball and cup show while political power is picking our pockets, as of last week, unless I'm mistaken. It's our legal requirement for people entering the United States to declare all their social media handles, mm-hmm. all email addresses, and then if selected for secondary screening, to enter into a legal gray area where anything you've put on the web can and will be taken out of context. So it's not whether comedians can make jokes about fat people or about different groups. It's how can individuals and journalists specifically protect themselves from decontextualization, not just of any joke, but of any sentence, any word, any intimation, any connection. I think that's the, the big change so, that's happened while, while we try to figure out what's right and what's wrong to be said on stage. So we have to protect ourselves from that policing, is what you're saying? No, from political power, oh, because that's... when the goal post change, you know, you know, a Republican government or a, you know, a Democratic government, whenever, whenever the laws change about what, what is, what, uh, what is right and what isn't, or what, what can be taken and used against you. Okay, fine. Uh, so, sec- who was the second speaker? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Hi. Um, so, I wanted, um, I wanted to make a point following the last two points just now, which is that jokes can be archived and you know brought back. So, Kevin Hart, I think it was last year or this year, the Oscars, it was some of his more 
because it's got the Arabic jokes that got brought back up, which kind of made he refused to apologize and then he didn't go on to host the Oscars. But then I also want to compare that to Mara Bergdorf, this really famous trans activist. And she made certain jokes about white people years and years ago before she kind of like had a massive come up. And the fact that there are certain people, certain figures, maybe it's definitely racialized, who are policed much more heavily in terms of what their previous, you know, what their jokes, which might have been problematic years and years before, have now come up. Whereas there are other comedians who just get away with it. Right. Yeah. Okay. I think that's really true. Lynn, and you've written about the trans community, and I just wonder what, what, whether you think there are boundaries and things should not be said or should be said. Just yeah. To, with that community in mind. Yeah. I mean, I think the the Ricky Gervais stuff that we saw there, I thought that was kind of mildly funny, but the trans stuff that he did in his last Netflix special. I, I, I just honestly didn't find it funny. I honestly found it really um, upsetting. I, I, I just found it really, really upsetting. And it was um, he was sort of saying things like, well, you know, I can identify as a monkey. Why, why can't, you know, so isn't that the same thing? But there was this sort of, like, gleefulness to his... Um, uh, his, his, you know, that's his kind of shtick, right? That he has this, like, I can't say it, I can't say it, I can't say it. But he is saying it right. in front of a huge audience who are all laughing with him because they're fans uh, and to sort of millions more. So he, he can say it. And then the trans thing, I think the Monroe Bergdorf thing, I think that that's, yeah, she, as a trans woman of colour, um, her mistakes seem to matter more than other people's, and, and that, that shouldn't be the case. So a few times, you've, the people have suggested it's who's, and Libby, I'm going to bring you in because okay. you, um, it's about who's saying it. Lib Libby, me. Well, what I, I just think we really have to divide out two things. One is about justice and employment and equal opportunities and people in positions of power who voice ridiculous prejudices, whether it's against trans people, whether it's against uh, people of colour, whether it's against Jews, whatever it is. That's no good. Mm -hmm. That is different. However, conversation, comedy... Mm -hmm. uh, Tweets, you know, people who are nobody in particular. Mm. You know, Ricky Gervais is just a kind of rather ugly, <laughs> not very funny git, really, who I've never, <laughs> never found funny at all. Um, and I can say that. We've got to bring back good old-fashioned despising. And, <laughs> <laughs> and say, it, yeah, yes, OK, a lot of people are laughing. Well, look at them. Pillocks, really. And, I mean, if you feel offended by awful stuff mm. in, in his track, I'm sure it was awful. I'm sure it wasn't funny it either. It wasn't funny, and it was very but cool. That's fine. You say it. You're out there. We yeah. have an internet. Get out there. Get all yeah. the trans people. Argue back. I mean, I do this even about really deeply serious things like anti-Semitism and race. You know, I don't immediately say, you're a racist. I can't be in a room with you. You know, I say, hey, well, that's ridiculous. You can't say that about Chinese people because this, because that, because the other. Mm. You know, you argue, you despise, mm. you kind of, you, 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 you join in. What we're getting at the moment, ever since Tony Blair's hate speech law, mm. is this extraordinary belief that anything anyone says legitimises lots of other people to think it too. And I truly don't believe that. In my lifetime, I have listened to incredibly rude words about gay people. Mm. Unbelievable. You all know the words. I'm not going to quote them because we're streaming. Um, and during that lifetime, gradually, more and more people have understood and accepted varied sexualities. We have gay marriage put, brought in by a Tory government. Mm. You know, I do not think this legitimising argument is a good one. I think it is simply something people say in order to close down a comedian or close down some politician who once said something stupid. So you're actually saying the opposite of something I was going to suggest later, that this opens up a conversation between two camps, possibly, rather than the idea that something that I would find hateful, a comedy about yeah. trans community, for example, might lead to hate in the real world. I don't. I don't believe that. I don't say. I say, that. get out there and hate right back. Okay. In yes. the days when there were gatekeepers, so there, there were gatekeepers. There was only the BBC. There was only publishing houses and only newspapers. More difficult now. The gates are open. We can open. all say our bit. As in Scarlet and her can people I? did brilliantly. We have quite literally seen it legitimise people, though, over the past three years. Statistically, I'm afraid to say, it, there has been statistics. Yeah. Tom can can it be it. proved? Can that be absolutely proved? But, 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 but those but people Ronald, thought that Donald already Trump, and just yeah, enjoyed thought it. thought it, but didn't say it. And there's a huge difference between what you think and what you say. And Donald Trump and people like him have legitimised sexist, racist, homophobic behaviour. And I've seen it for myself. I have male friends in America who now feel OK 
Also, about not have said that before. No. Okay. Sorry, I just, I just, I just want to say, like, yes. it's it's extremely frustrating to hear a white woman talk about whether um, racism is is peaking or not, or if or if uh, you know people that say stuff that are offensive towards the trans community, if that's really a problem or not, because it doesn't affect you. So, for instance, I live in the States. Why Donald Trump, um, when he became president, I'd lived there for 10 years, not a word, everything was fine. In the space of a year, I got called uh, a nigger at uh, in four different separate events. That had never happened to so me Michelle, in my you, lifetime. Do you think there's a night there and I separated out people with political power, people with influence. Yes. I separate that out. I'm what talking I'm try- about conversations between people. Right. Ah. What I'm trying to say is that we don't always get the luxury of like having a conversation. And why and why and what you're speaking about is great. It's great to have a conversation when the moment permits. But why people are joking and saying certain things and being insensitive to certain minorities, what happens is other people out on the street become confident and start going, oh, right, yeah, you okay. said that, and I can it's say not this. not just people in power, because if you're in a group of friends yeah. and there's one sexist or one racist who starts talking, we've all seen this happen, suddenly the whole, you know, it's why we have this idea of locker room talk, suddenly the whole group is joining in. It's not just... Okay, but I'd, I'd, rather, I'd rather know that the talk is out yeah. there. I well, would, that people used to just feel it secretly <laughs> and 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 I, I would I, I quite like it being out there because you can challenge it when it's out there and yes of course I mean I don't want to bring Trump in this because positions of power positions of you know political and economic power are really important you have to consider that but I do think that it is better to know the awful things that people think and say so we are going to argue back we're going to put a stop to this extremely passionate panel talking <laughs> so that we can recap talking I'll come back to this but we must must go to number three <laughs> <laughs> I think a bit like Libby, my name is Dario, I think a bit like Libby because I actually would rather people say what they think rather than hide it because then what comes out is that they behave as they think but don't actually say it. So you can't read them anymore. So it's better to be explicit, this is what I think, and then I can decide how I want to handle it. Right. And if people think like me, they I expect them to say something about what they think. Um, and I prefer it to be open rather than trying to shut people It's best to stare an asshole in the face than find out. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I, have, I, have a, I have a friend who's... Number four. Sorry, I'm going to be strict about this. Four, yeah. Oh. Yes, okay. Um, Tess, from Just to move it along the week. Um, what I find with my children, who are fantastically opinionated, they are self censoring for fear of causing offence. And what I spend an awful lot of time talking to them about is you play the ball, not the man. You tackle the argument, you yeah. don't. You don't have to take a person down, but you can, you have to take an argument down. You have to be unafraid to take down something that you disagree with. But they, they you know, one of my children in RS, you know, committed atheists since about the age of three and a half, as far as I can work out. Um, is in, uh, her school report comes out, she's entirely silent. And this girl's like, oh, Christ, you know, she's just wearing herself out of home or something. Because, but she is fearful of upsetting anyone who has a faith. And I'm like, it's okay to discuss it. You don't have to, you know, criticise them personally. You have to, do, you know, look at the argument, not the person. And that's, I think, the self-censoring aspect of the fear of causing offence is a real issue. We have to be able to destroy shit arguments. Is we it, have to be able to discuss it. Is it more of an issue that she's scared to say something than she really upsets a girl in her class who then goes home and cries? Like, surely that's a worse fate. Well, um, okay, yeah. so I have a similar view to you on this, and I'm talking about this a lot in my new show that I'm writing. Um, I feel like uh, I've always been fat, and I've had, it's not the same as a race uh, conversation at all, but um, it's the only thing I can c- connect it to. But people have always said in whatever way they want to, that they don't like the way I look, and all that sort of stuff. And it's happened in many different ways. And what my mother did is teach me how to have an armour. And I spoke to an old lady, which is my partner's grandmother, who was uh, 90 years old. 
and um, I sort of decided I was going to ask her some questions about stuff because I imagined at the age of 90 not a lot of people are asking her questions <laughs> um, and she said something really interesting to me is it alright if I read it to you because I for the show I sort of I recorded her without her knowing but that's fine um, um, and I, I recorded her because she was saying nice things about my partner and I thought we should hear it later on but I, I got this other bit of information from her that she um, that she said that I, I think is really uh, a, a similar thing she said um, here it is I said to her, Doris, what do you worry about? And she said, I worry, she said, I worry about the youth. She said, when we were young, there was just one enemy, Heather. Um, <laughs> I worry that the kids today are trying to find their identity by creating enemies everywhere and manufacturing trauma. And actually, they won't be able to cope when they're my age and all your friends have passed on. No one takes photos of you anymore or even listens to you. And I worry that they won't be able to actually cope when real life happens. So, so I said to her, this is where it goes off the killer of sight. I said, Doris, what would solve the issue? She said, a war. I don't think... <laughs> I, I don't think a war is what we need, mainly because a lot of the snowflakes wouldn't be able to deal with the war right now either. They couldn't even handle friends. But I think that, that I think there is some argument in there that there's this fear of, of like, my mother made... My sister and I did something called freestyle disco dancing, which is the most culturally breath form of dance you ever heard of. My sister was really good at it and I was shit at it for 13 years and my mum wouldn't let me quit because she wanted me to not to stick at something and what she enabled happened even and I kicked and screamed in yeah. uh, every single week she built up an armor for me and I think that's the it's being able to allow kids to be able to work out what's right and wrong rather than telling them what is already is for them to work it out to have that feeling of sickness when yeah. they do something well, wrong we were, okay. we, were, we were always told sticks and stones and it'll break my bones yeah. names will never hurt me and so on but actually of course there are cases where names do hurt people because yeah. they affect their employment rights because they affect how yes. people look at them and then I think you get this point you have to argue I have a friend an old friend I worked with him years ago and we reconnected later because he'd had cancer and everything we we have a drink together sometimes and he suddenly came up with some amazing anti-semitic remark mm. I said Michael what and he sort of started in, and I realised he believed in the international Jewish conspiracy. So I devoted 25 minutes <laughs> of solid work mm. to talking him out of this, and he became more and more sheepish. No, all right then. If he'd never said that, he's been an employer in mm. media quite a big way. If he'd never said that, if no one had ever argued with him, he'd have just been quietly not employing anybody of the Israeli tendency or whatever. He, mm. You know, it, it, it's you. You need to be able to argue. I love Scarlett's book. Um, collection of things, and about sort of 50% of it, um, I kind of go, what, what, what is the philosophy and in intersectionality again? You know, some of these American essays and so on. Um, and then the other half of it, I'm just punching there and saying, yeah, great, bloody good arguments, go for it. Okay. You know. And I, I, I want to continue this. I think this is, has fruitful inquiries, but we, I want to also go to the room. Was there a five or a six? No, no, let's tell the truth. Did I? They're <laughs> <laughs> frightened. No, OK, let's start with you two have been waiting a while, and that, you are number three, and you are number four. So, go for it. Uh, my name is Diora, and I just wanted to make a quick comment um, on sort of doing the arguing back. Um, when someone says something really shitty. Um, I think we don't take into account the emotional labor that that might require, and also the massive privilege of being able to argue something back. So for example, if the issue is on um, transphobia or racism and it doesn't apply to you, of course it's so much easier to debate about it. But if it's to do with your everyday life and your very existence, why should that person have to go out there and spend their entire energy to just prove to the other person that they're allowed to exist in the way that they do. And I just think we massively miss out the aspect of privilege in this conversation. And, and, and of course, it's also assuming that that, that conversation will lead to some change. Of so if you have a conversation with Nigel Farage, he will be talked out of his opinion or his firmly held beliefs. So there's that. I think that's an amazing point. Yeah, mm -hmm. likewise. That's it. I was just Thank you. Um, excuse <laughs> me. <laughs> um, I'm Rachel. Um, this is where I think intention and accountability are also really important things. So, I mean, 
I don't find Ricky Gervais's thing particularly funny. I mean, it's funny in some ways, but it's, it's not ultimately funny, because what he's really trying to do is shame people. And I think that trying to shame people just isn't, you know, it's unnecessary. It's like, it actually says more about the person themselves and their own insecurities rather than anything else. Well, certainly do the despising. Go for it. You're doing well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think, really, when, when people are intolerant of others, Again, it says more about them and their own insecurities than, than the, other, the other people. So my what I try and do when I deal with other people's crap is just be compassionate towards them. But it, I also appreciate that it's not that easy. And ultimately, if you put something out into the world, a really important tool is learning to you know, be mindful of what impact that might have. And sometimes you can't predict the impact that it might have. Um, and that's also important to consider. And you're talking within the context of comedy? I'm talking within everything, things that can't be said. So when you say something, it might have unintended consequences and you need to be prepared to face that. And this is where actually being able to say, you know what, I got something wrong. I'm really mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. Like, that was my shit and I'm going to work on it. And thank you for raising this. It's really, really important because that goes a long way towards actually be able to build bridges between groups of people and that's really what we need to do more of in the world in my opinion. Thank you. Number three. We didn't know which one was going to ask. Oh, three. Yeah, you'll be the next. Oh, um, well, typically, uh, I'm Thomas. Uh, one thing that I don't really find funny is that someone can say something that is perceived as offensive and then held accountable with it, for it or be punched in the face. Four years ago, a few, uh, some authors were killed in Paris because someone someone found what, what they were writing this offensive. Is yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are things that are obviously offensive, but you know, anyone can can uh, be offended by anything. Uh, so where do we stop? We can assume that you're obviously doing jokes about race or things that people can are born with or can't do anything about is wrong, but then there's ideas, religion, and all sorts of things. So I, I think the people should just get, get, get on with the fact that they can't be offended without... But you, you can't tell people not to be offended because that's a feeling. Well, yeah, I don't know, of course, but yeah, yeah. I, can, I, I am offended by many things, but then it's, I'm not trying to stop being offended. Okay, four. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, my name's Charlotte. I wanted to say something about context, um, because I think that there is a tendency, in particular in this debate when we talk about comedy, to sort of act as if, you know, there's this one lone stage and a bright spotlight on it, and there's sort of one person standing there, and they make a joke about a minority, and, you know, everyone laughs and it's fine, and that doesn't carry over into the wider world. Um, but two sessions ago, we were talking about women's rights, and we had Gina Miller on the panel, she was amazing, um, and they had some stats about Diane Abbott as well. And Gina Miller was talking about just the volume of abuse that she receives online. There were stats about how much abuse female politicians and public figures receive online, and a stat that 45% of them personally directed Diane Abbott. And I just think whenever we talk about offence as if it can be sort of freely and equally given and received, it doesn't take into account those massive structural inequalities that already exist, so that that is more likely to so upset people? Bit on things that people have been sort of suggesting again and again, we haven't addressed. It's who's saying the joke and who, which community is the joke angled at. So once we've gone through the, the last number, can we address that? Whose number? Yes, you, that was you, Madam. I was wondering what, what number I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I can't believe I'm saying this as a kinky-haired uh, black woman in the room, but I am saying it. Um, it seems political correctness only applies to the majorities and not the minorities. So um, it's almost a requirement for them. Somehow, I don't know who imposed it, but it's there. So as an African woman, I can say all sorts of things about race, um, whether real or perceived, whether racism has happened or not. I, I almost get the sense that I can do that, but I get very uncomfortable when it's the other way around. So if a white person is feeling mm -hmm. jittery about racial things, whether I've done them or not, I start calling out, oh, oh, they were not being very nice. Maybe they were just paying me a genuine comment about my spiky hair. And like, no, they had to bring up hair, you know, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
it's constantly present. And I think yeah. minorities should be called out to things like that as well. And it's across yeah. the spectrum. Yeah. LGBT AI people would will behave like this, uh, Christians would behave like this, Muslims would behave like this. Like, as they, I don't know. I'm sure you understand yeah. what I'm saying. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. There's a gentleman there that's had his hand up really um, stoically for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, if we're talking about... What's your name? My name is Kieran. If we're talking about comedy... Um, and, well, I'd like to know how many people have, have sat through the film special by Dave Chappelle, who appears in the programme. The point I wanted to make was that potentially the solution to all this lies within comedians them, themselves. The best comedians have better jokes than the Ricky Gervais material we, we've selected today. Mm. And Dave Chappelle in a special called The Bird Revelation, a small sitting on a stool thing. And this is a guy who walked away from the corrupt uh, Harvey Weinstein, a Hollywood poisonous environment to disappear to Africa. And he actually studied, studied structural inequality there and came back to say that if we're going after individuals and individual targets for saying offensive things, we're going to make a lot of imperfect allies along the way and what we need to do in relation to the point that you drew a pause there is create a, a system much like the dismantling of apartheid in South Africa and drawing on that dialogue. Create a system in which people can come forward and say, yes, I've, I've fucked up, but be free of that immediate persecution that is resulting in people's reputations being destroyed, careers being destroyed, and the assumption of great guilt based on nothing more than an outraged allegation. Yeah. Okay. So to go back to the comedians themselves, there's actually a lot more thoughtfulness than uh, the jokes that we're all getting outraged about. Right, okay. Can, can, I, can we address this? You know, who's saying the joke and what's the joke? Because, you know, we can... Jokes angled at power and, and, you know, majority groups seem to be part of the course and we don't seem to regard them as offensive. Well, even if they are offensive, we seem to think they're okay. Jokes angled at... Uh, people of colour, uh, people with disabilities, uh, things like sexuality, trans community, gay, gay communities, uh, are they more offensive because they're taking a pop at, at groups that haven't held power and have had a history of persecution? So a really extreme example is the Holocaust joke. What do we think of the Holocaust joke? Because if everything's up... I think, I think, I think it's, that's, it's kind of... Uh, there's a, I think there is a feeling around that it's harder and harder and harder to make the really awful jokes and that that's good. You know, that's, it's kind of... People, people are nice. Over, over there, somebody was saying, basically, we should all just be better. We should right. be nicer. And I think the idea of people just being nicer is actually sort of... It's getting, it's getting traction now. And that the Holocaust joke is the thing that you just can't do. Though, actually, there was an incredibly funny play called Bad Jews where there was a Holocaust joke in it and the entire audience, mostly non-Jewish, sort of sat there and then we all just laughed because we had to, because it, because it was a good joke and it, because it was, it was an insider joke. But, you know, that was really rare. Okay. My question is... Uh, how do we, this is everything everyone's saying is perfect and everyone's right and everyone's got a point about stuff but there's a big majority of the UK who aren't in London mm. having Prosecco sat in a room <laughs> like this with everyone sat here at tables who are probably the ones that have said awful things on Twitter about my weight and stuff every time they see me on telly and the reason they do that is because they're just not thinking and there's all sorts of shit going on in their lives how do we, and I'm sorry I'm asking a question, but how do we as a group help be compassionate to people that don't have this kind of education uh, who, are, who are probably part of the issue? I don't think it's all just out of education. I, I live in rural Suffolk. I mean, I don't live in the London bubble at all, nowhere near it, none of the time. And I, I think that actually people are far less malicious the, the, than you're suggesting. I mean, they, oh, there's always the gits who get on Twitter. We all know about them. You mute them. You know, you block them. You just do it. I mute 20 a day. Um, but, but there's, <laughs> sorry if anyone here. <laughs> the issue here is like, let's change the topic of the thinking. Let's stop saying, let's stop trying to silence people who are calling out offensive comments and instead amplify those voices so the people that need to hear them actually hear them. Like, we're having this weird reverse conversation where we're trying to shut people up when they're saying that they're upset 
whereas actually shouldn't that be the way that people know that they're yep. upset? And I also think someone, sorry, I'll shut up. Yeah, um, you know, someone before said, like, we were talking about the building an armor and being less, yeah, and being less upset. And, like, you know, I have had in many ways a very privileged life in a bajillion ways. I've also, you know, been through masses of abuse and horrible things. And I particularly choose to stay vulnerable. Like, I think being vulnerable is my strongest power. And I think being able to feel the things that other people say is a beautiful thing and a way that we can move forward. And obviously, it means that you, like, cry all the time and, do, you know, feel horrible. And that is hard. But I think we shouldn't be telling people not to be vulnerable anymore. I think I've, um, sorry. Um, I was going to say I think as well it's um, you, you were just talking about Holocaust joke. I'm I'm Jewish and like no one likes to make jokes about Jews more than Jews. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I come from a family of them. We live for that. Um, and, uh, and, and Sarah Silverman's made a career yes. of it. So again, um, that's why I said who's you know right. It's but, about who's telling but, the but but I think I think to sort of sum up, especially what you're saying, um, uh, it's good to be vulnerable. It's also good if. If you don't like, for instance, I didn't like the Ricky Gervais special, I turn it off. Yeah. Sit. I'm not saying you can't do the special. Go do the special. I personally, I personally don't want to watch it. And so I think we are allowed to censor what we see as well. So I might not like what you're saying. See ya. Do you know what I mean? But I can. Michelle, can I just ask a question? So you, you, it's okay because you're Jewish and you can make Jewish shows. Would you be, uh, would you find it distasteful if, if a non-Jewish person made it? Oh it? no, it happens, and I, I because I'm should black it, as well, I hear anti-Semitism all the time, where I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Jew, and of course I don't. So, 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 so that's my little window into what I imagine um, comfortable racist chat is, because I never, I'm, very rarely am I privy to that. Okay. Um, but I, 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 genu I truly believe you are allowed to say what you want, okay. but you can't be okay. sensitive about if there's any repercussions so to repercussions, it. Repercussions, really can, I, can, I, can yeah. I just very hastily drag it, drag it back to, uh, to you and to trance, because we have this situation at the moment where people are being called out and silenced and punched in the face for saying things like they do not actually believe that trans women are totally quite the same thing as women. And there's huge rage. I mean, that's, that, that's, that's a case of some people being shut down for something they sincerely and honestly believe biologically. Um, are, are they right or are they wrong to shut them down? Ooh, <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> you, you brought up trans. Oh, it's a hot one. remaining time I have. Um, and I, I'm not a trans woman, and, uh, but... Um, yeah, I think that is obviously a really clear example of a debate online that has become completely toxic. Uh, you know, you were calling, you know, you were saying earlier on, Libby, uh, you know, there should be hate, but actually I think that this has, that debate has just become so hate-filled, and it's become, I think it's become so hate-filled because, it, it, and I know it happens in real life as well, but so much of it has happened on the internet with people shouting at each other or people having columns in, in, in you know, board newspapers in the Times, if we're, if we're to be frank. And then, uh, but uh, it still hasn't happened enough, I think, in, in, in rooms and in classrooms and in rooms like this. And I think there's a real difference to if you talk about any trans issues, even if you get into very naughty and complicated issues, but if you're looking at a, a trans person and you're having that conversation, that feels completely different than kind of shouting online, which is what has been happening. I think the problem is it does happen in real life, though. I did an yeah. event with Momo Bergdorf the other day, and we were getting hundreds of threats that people were going to come and kill her for the days leading up to the event, and we had to get extra security at the event, and she was terrified the entire time and had to hide in the room behind the thing because of the stuff we were getting. So it does happen. And, and in real life. Right. Uh, let's get on to the speakers first. So go. Okay. Uh, I'm Lisa. I just want to say that in, in sort of argue for vulnerability, I think one of the things that has done people in this country more damage, including a lot of our senior politicians, is the great British stiff upper lip. And actually, I think a change in culture where people go, ouch, that hurts, is actually a really good thing. I agree. I agree. It's beautifully said. Thank you. Who was number two? 
Um, I just want to build from the vulnerability point. So I just came back from Australia, I lived there for four months, and I found that racism was actually internalised and it was almost seen as banter because it was so subtle. So for example, um, my friend who's a North London gal, like she's got a backbone, right, but she had an Australian boyfriend and he would just call her curry. And it was normalised though, she would, she would be like, oh, that, that's banter, don't worry about it. I was so shocked. And I feel like it's almost a defense me mechanism that they do to protect themselves, and I think it's problem. Yeah. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, so I'm Tom. So very quickly to actually echo Jess's point, and maybe counters what Libby was saying before about um, maybe sort of just um, speaking back. And I would sometimes, you know, if you ever got bullied at school, it's one thing people t uh, take the piss, make these jokes. And the one thing you would do if you're someone that gets bullied, you'd laugh a lot. Mm -hmm. And the laughing along actually, and it goes back to what you're talking about, about legitimizing, and there might be some empirical data, I don't have it to my hand. Um, but that laughing along, that was why they kept doing what they were actually doing. And that was something, I can reflect back on that now and think, oh, no, no, but yeah, I was, I was 13 years old. Laughing along. And, but, and, and two, yeah, but two, yeah, two more important things. Um, I think the kind of talk has been focused around today about the social utility of, of offense. I think most of us can say that offence may be some form of litmus test for what can and cannot be said, and you obviously need to be able to offend. But the question is, as we were talking about before, are you going out and actively trying to offend uh, people, particularly people that are in uh, very vulnerable, uh, or particularly vulnerable positions? And um, the social utility for comedy for someone like me is something that, um, that reflects my vulnerability and reflects the struggles I go through. And that can be going down to the working men's club and having a laugh at you know, politicians, at people in power. It's not something that is used as a constructive uh, mechanism. It's not something that should be used to, um, to uh, you know, poke fun at you know, people, people in trouble. And I think comedy can have a healing and you know, unifying effect, but it just depends upon what you're saying. It links back to what you were, you were saying about how do we do you transform it from within? And there's my, one of my favourite comedians at the moment is Stuart Lee. I was talking about this before, but, and the reason he is because he he takes the mick out of UKIP. He takes the piss out of like, these racists in a kind of maybe a snobber, snobberish way, but he does it in a way which makes me reflect upon you know, other kinds of comedians. I, I also love Ricky Gervais, just to clarify. I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> but the, the Office rather than necessarily. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. But the, there are two. There are two speakers. Sorry, and then Jade. So you, madam, then you, and then Jade. Hi, I'm Francis. I wanted to raise an issue about what I would call scarring effects, where so if somebody has um, experienced really a, a lot of online abuse, and perhaps said something that they've unwisely said, um, then although they may recover from that effect, I mean, Twitter flaming is a horrible experience if anybody's ever been through it, um, but it leaves you scarred, it makes, makes you wary about saying anything ever again. Mm, yeah. Very and um, I speak from personal experience on this, that I got flamed over something that I unwisely said in relation to Muslim refugees, who I have strongly supported and publicly for a very long time, um, got flamed by the American alt-right, nearly driven off Twitter. I had campaigns against me to terminate my relationship with Forbes, who I write for, and with the F Financial Times, who I was writing for at the time, there were sustained campaigns to silence me. Um, from time to time, this was some years ago now, from time to time it still pops up in a different context. Somebody will pick up what I said and say, oh, you were the person who said this. Oh, okay, well, not that old chestnut again. Um, it makes me wary of saying anything again. Even though my views haven't changed. I am still, my views on Muslim refugees are still what they always have been. I believe we should be, as a civilised society, opening our doors to the refugee and the stranger in our midst and offering them security and, and, and home and comfort, and I don't care what faith they are. That's my personal view, and I'm not afraid to say so. But on Twitter now, I'm very reluctant to say that because of the scarring effect of having been dumped on in that way by people who were not being funny. They didn't find it funny. I had death threats. I think the thing is that, that, I mean, that is public life. Because if you, if you do a lot of tweeting, even if you're not a politician or anybody official, you're in public life. I think what has suddenly happened is that a great many people have suddenly become in public life because of 
the media, and, and politicians have always had it, and I think we sort of have to have it too. Yeah, so it's the difference, isn't there, between people who, in, people who do that knowing, in a way, that they're inviting a response, yeah. and people who just say something unwise. But why do we have to put up with it as well? <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I did want to put out there is, is whether the boundaries change what can and can't be said online, you know, and on Twitter, because I, you know, I think, I think the sort of unsaid rules are different, and perhaps we can be ruder, or perhaps we can be just different, speak in different tones yes, on, on, in, on Twitter. But sadly, do you see the flag is waving at us? But I do want to give, I did promise somebody um, a voice, so, so go for it, before I then wrap up, sadly. So you want me as a black woman, that was damaging... Um, types of things that cannot be seen are the innocent ones, the ones that are well-meaning. And I'll tell you a story. Um, I was a seven-year-old, spiky-haired boy, and he came to me one day from the bathroom and said, Mommy, what's normal? And I said, it's how something um, should be. He said, OK. And he was holding a bottle of uh, Pantene uh, shampoo. And he read it out to me. It said, um, and we love Pantene shampoo. He said, um, it says this shampoo is for, <laughs> it's so painful. It's for normal and mixed hair. And he said to me, so what's my hair? Like this shampoo is for use for normal hair, Caucasian, and mixed hair. So he said to me, what about my hair? What should I use? And it hurt me so so much that a shampoo bottle was causing us so much pain to a seven-year-old who was now feeling that his, the way his hair grows from his God-given hair isn't normal, isn't right. And we're still having conversations about that to teach him that. He's seven. I, 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 I haven't gotten the strength to write to Pantene. I'm inviting anybody who can, just get a bottle of Pantene, look at it. If you have the courage, write to them. It's not right. Thank you. So I, I, do, I have the incredibly um, intimidating task now of sort of gathering a sense of where we went in the direction of the talk and what our further possible... Sorry, Jade, we did... I've just... Just remembered, I promised you. The only thing I wanted to say uh, uh, was uh, just a sentence, which is, even though all of this stuff is valid and your experience is incredibly valid, and but as you've pointed out, you'd never know what side you're on, whether you're the person that's being offended or you're the one causing the offence. And that's where this question is, is that... I, uh, I upset a load of Little Mix fans because I made a joke about one of them. <laughs> and I spent three days getting death threats from 17-year-old girls about it. So, to them, they're probably somewhere having one of these meetings about people like me. <laughs> so how do you know where you are on the spectrum of who's an arsehole and who's not? Anyway, so that's, that's, a, yeah. that's a very funny and clever way of just highlighting the the ironies and paradoxes that have come up time and again in this room, so that actually pinning down what things ought not to be said ought to do has actually become quite tricky, because this is shifting ground, I feel. But there's been some amazing and really uh, memorable things that have been said and remarks that have been made. Libby, bring back good old-fashioned despising. <laughs> and that's got, um, that's got a certain power and appeal to it. And... Also, this, this idea of the conversation, you know, um, uh, uh, of those edgier, offensive subjects that we've, we've talked about. So, so opening up a conversation opens up the possibility of connection, changing people's minds, uh, a, a, a transformation of hate into something else, versus legitimizing, you know, the legitimizing of hate leading to real-world hate, because there is actually uh, uh, empirical evidence to suggest that it does. Uh, the, the appropriation or misappropriation of this term political correctness by the side that has power in the first place is something that you were suggesting, and it's a, it's a, it's a strong sort of thought that, that, will, that I'm going to be thinking about, you know, who owns political correctness, who owns that term, and what can be how can it be used in, in ways to silence? 
um, or legitimize. Um, there were lots of people talking about self-censorship, um, there were people talking about uh, Ricky Gervais, and I feel we chose the wrong, and I very, <laughs> on purpose, chose, chose a very benign, um, uh, yeah, but probably more uh, on the scale of his offensiveness, that's probably <laughs> sort of the benign end. Um, and people, people, you know, people were saying it's a persona, it's a persona of ignorance, which is an interesting um, idea to, you know, you deliver... Um, edgy comedy through persona, through ignorance, through this meta, you know, Ricky Gervais is actually laughing along, at, you know, with, with us at, at the ignorance of this man. Um, somebody s talked about manufacturing trauma. I don't know who it was now. But Doris. Do Doris. Okay, Doris. <laughs> so, so manufacturing trauma, this idea that perhaps we are a bit snowflakey, the idea that perhaps... Um, we live in a culture where we all take offence very easily. We're all the first thing we, you know, feel is offence and trauma and, and upset uh, when we when we're met met with things we don't ag agree with. Um, but then we also heard about uh, the um, a, a, there were there were people talking about. Um, your conversation, you know, this idea of opening up a conversation. Someone talked about the emotional uh, uh, drain of having to have that conversation um, and having to explain and, and t take that explanation on board. Um, Jade, you introduced this idea of being armoured, building up your armour against social stigma, offence, you know, the, the offences that people cause you. Versus, I thought this was really powerful, the staying vulnerable. And you said this, Charlotte, you said oh, people were calling for, for more vulnerability, um, saying, ouch, that hurts. So, so living in a culture where you're allowed to say, ouch, I'm hurt, that hurt me. Um, I'm vulnerable rather than I'm strong and I can, this, this um, the sticks and stones you've just hurled at me and with your words, the violence of your words, you know, I can, my armor's kind of, it's, it's bounced off my armor. So, so there was those, that was that sort of like paradox again. You know, do we do we become strong against defense, or do we actually want to it, acknowledge and maybe even indulge in the vulnerability of, of of being different? Again and again, I think we kept skirting around. No one really addressed, including me. Um, power of jokes. You know, who the jo who the jokes being, who's saying the joke, and and. Who it's, which, which group it's angled towards and the power differential within that, so, you know, the minority groups that we're joking, that, that someone like Ricky Gervais is, uh, is um, joking about. So there's power within that and politics within that. Um, I'm exhausted by, <laughs> by that because there's such a richness of, of discussion there. Um, and I'm, I think I'm going to leave it inconclusive. There are many things, there are many arguments and, and strains I left out, and I'm sorry that I did, but it's been a fantastically passionate, fierce, combative discussion. There's tons and tons we could have said. I don't think any of it would have been um, conclusive, and perhaps that's a good thing, so we, we will agree to disagree. Um, thank you, Jade. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Scarlett, Libby, Lynn, and all of you for being brilliant with your comments. Thanks very much.